This week on Jerusalem Dateline, tension builds between Israel and Iran over its nuclear program, and the impact is felt up on Israel's northern border. Plus, could Saudi Arabia allow a Christian church in the heart of Islam? And written in stone, the evidence for King David. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. New satellite images reveal Israel is dramatically expanding its secretive nuclear facility at the center of its undeclared atomic weapons program. The photos show a construction site about the size of a soccer field next to Israel's nuclear research center. The facility is home to underground labs that reprocess nuclear material to weapons-grade plutonium. Experts estimate Israel has material for at least 80 atomic bombs. But the main focus now is on Iran's nuclear program. Currently, Iran and the U.S. are locked in a face-off over the Iranian nuclear deal, and Israel is caught in the middle. Iran says economic sanctions must end before any new talks. But the U.S. says Iran must comply with the 2015 nuclear agreement before sanctions are lifted. Recently, Iran raised the stakes, and we went up to the north to see the impact on the Israeli-Lebanese border. Sunday, the head of the U.N. nuclear watchdog announced Iran will provide less access to its atomic program. The move is a response to U.S. refusal to lift sanctions, which Iran is demanding as a condition to return to the negotiating table. Some warn if negotiations lead to sanctions relief, it would begin a financial chain reaction in the region. If more money would go to the IRGC, to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, it would mean more money for Hezbollah in Lebanon, more money for Hezbollah in Syria, or the uh, other uh, proxies of Iran in Syria, in Yemen, in Iraq, and more instability in general to the Middle East. You're already seeing Iran show tremendous aggression. It is increasing rapidly its enrichment of uh, uranium now to high level enrichments that, you know, very, very close to bomb making capacity. Middle East observer Joel Rosenberg fears negotiations could force Israel to strike first. That with Biden trying to get back into the nuclear deal, Israel might decide it has to take preemptive military action against Iran's nuclear facilities. And then what would be Iran's counterpunch? Almost certainly it would be by ordering the Hezbollah military to fire its 150,000 or so missiles and rockets here at Israel, which would be devastating. A war of words has already begun on Israel's northern border. Israel's Defense Minister Benny Gantz declared Lebanon's ground would tremble if Hezbollah attacked, while Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah boasted his military can hit anywhere in Israel and that Israel would not see anything like it since the founding of the state. Just days ago, Israel's Air Force launched an exercise that simulated 3,000 strikes on Hezbollah targets within 24 hours. That's a great capability, and it's a message to Hezbollah. We know where you are, and we will get you. Israel's military predicted in 2021 that Hezbollah does not want to enter into a full-scale war. But in 2006, the second Lebanon war began with a small ambush. So they know anything could happen here on the Israeli-Lebanese border. Here in the north, every small match can uh, fuel a huge explosion. In another hot spot, the U.S. launched airstrikes in Syria near the Iraqi border to strike targets used by Iranian-backed militia groups. The Pentagon said the strikes were in retaliation for a rocket attack in Iraq earlier this month that killed one civilian contractor and wounded a U.S. service member along with other coalition troops. We're confident in the, in the target that we went after. We know what we hit. Uh, and, uh, and we're confident that that target was being used by the same uh, Shia militia that, uh, that conducted the, the strikes. Another battle line in the Middle East is the classroom. The United Nations group responsible for overseeing Palestinian refugee education recently stated it had removed violent and anti-Israel content from school text. A new investigation questions that so-called resolution, finding any changes don't go far enough. 
During 2020, Palestinian children, like many others around the world, couldn't go to school due to COVID-19. During that time, United Nations Relief Works Agency, or UNRWA, produced and provided the students material that went way beyond reading, writing, and arithmetic. We found that it contains various violations of UN values, of UNESCO standards, and of UNRWA's own principles. These were educational materials which were distributed to over 320,000 Palestinian children across the West Bank and Gaza. Marcus Sheff leads a group that monitors peace and cultural tolerance in schools. It examined the material sent to those children, and what they found was not good. The idea that UNRWA, a UN organization, is distributing uh, material which calls on students to defend the motherland with blood um, or that glorifies terrorists and directs students to terrorists like Dalla Mugrabi, who is in their materials a, a role model for young girls, somebody who murdered 38 people, including 13 children on a civilian bus. This impact group report from January lays out examples found throughout the curriculum. In mathematics, students are asked to write the number of martyrs in the first intifada. A language studies question asks students to find the preposition in a sentence like, jihad is one of the doors to paradise. And in social studies, where Zionist policy is blamed for exhausting Palestinian natural resources. It was written by UNRWA's teachers. Now, UNRWA's teachers are supposed to be trained in UN values of peace and tolerance. Following the January impact report, UNRWA admitted to the problem and assured governments it had been addressed. A follow-up study by the impact team, however, shows that was not the case. Within these materials, we also found hateful material, material which young people anywhere should not be studying and certainly not being taught by a UN organization. So, you know, I think what um, we see here is that, you know, UNRWA is absolutely part of the problem in relation to the incitement of young people in the region. In one social studies exercise, sixth graders are shown a map of the British mandate called Palestine that does not include any Israel reference and told Palestine is the geographical area which extends from the Mediterranean Sea in the west to the River Jordan in the east and from Lebanon and Syria in the north to the Gulf of Aqaba and Egypt in the south. Its location gave it strategic importance, making it coveted by invaders and colonial powers. And there's another problem. And that is, if you have distributed print materials to 320,000 children, then you found that you had been distributing hateful material. How exactly did UNRWA get those materials back? We, we have no answer to that. Former President Trump cut funding to UNRWA because of this kind of incitement in Palestinian schools. President Biden has pledged to resume humanitarian aid to the Palestinians. Sheff maintains the world should expect transparency from any United Nations body. And until UNRWA can prove otherwise, it should be understood the organization teaches hate. Up next, Jewish rabbis in the Gulf states prepare for an influx of Jews from around the world. For a limited time, you can get five of CBN's critically acclaimed documentaries. Experience the rebirth of the modern state of Israel. A historic bond between the Jewish people and the land of Israel cannot be broken. Relive the battle for Jerusalem in the Six-Day War. Jerusalem is yours forever. Discover how Israeli volunteers are changing the world. When people need us, we volunteer and we come and help. Explore the world of Israeli technological innovation. We're people of dreams. God gives us dreams. And that's really the roots, I think, of, of much of our innovation. And understand the biggest land dispute in history. Many Palestinian Arabs claim that the Jews stole Arab land. But is that the real story? This exclusive Israel DVD collection can be yours for a gift of $40 or more. Call now or go online to get your Israel DVD bundle today.
here, we're committed to a heritage of rigorous scholarship dating back over a thousand years and to a faith tradition dating back a thousand more. This is how we create a culture of inquiry where no topic is off limits. And a culture of hope. Anything's possible! It's Christian leadership. And it's changing the world for the better. It's higher learning. It's greater knowing. It's what makes us whole. It's what makes us region. For the first time, Jewish communities in the Arab Gulf states are joining together. They believe an association will be necessary to handle the needs of an influx of Jewish people from around the world. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has that story. One of the many impacts of the Abraham Accords is how some Middle Eastern countries are opening up for Israelis to visit. It's also helping Jewish people feel freer to go public. American Rabbi Dr. Eli Abadi, a Lebanese native, and Bahraini Jewish businessman Ibrahim Dawu Nonu are leading the effort to organize for the locals and the expected influx of others. The Jewish communities in the Gulf are growing uh, slowly but significantly, uh, especially uh, in the last several months in which pretty much the entire Gulf kind of opened up. And so we have many uh, Jewish tourists, Jewish businessmen and businesswomen who are coming to uh, look for opportunities. Abadi says as rabbi for the group, he'll nurture the Jewish spiritual life. The group will also oversee practical matters like kosher food and a Jewish religious court to register marriages and settle disputes. We came to the realization that we need to be prepared for the growth, for the exponential growth of Jewish communities throughout the six Gulf uh, uh, countries. While many point to Israel's diplomatic and economic breakthroughs that began with two Persian Gulf countries, Abadi says his group focuses on faith communities. I think the Abraham Accord, in a sense, opened up a door that was there from before, in which people now may feel more comfortable living and experiencing Jewish life uh, in, in the open and publicly. No one knows how many Jewish people live in the Gulf states, but there are an estimated 1,000 Jews living in the United Arab Emirates alone. Huda Nonu, a former ambassador to the United States, says Bahrain has the Gulf's only indigenous Jewish community. Nonu tells CBS news that Jewish families first arrived in the late 1880s and quote, since that time our community has been part of the fabric of Bahrain society. As a result, we understand the needs of some of the smaller or newer communities in the region. Abadi believes a number of reasons will bring Jews and Israelis to the Gulf states. Aspect number one is uh, it's just a new frontier for people that have wandered the globe for over 2,000 years, the Jewish people, mm -hmm. from place to place. While business and tourism will also likely be a draw, Abadi sees the Gulf states becoming a safe haven for those fleeing growing anti-Semitism in the West. You're going to have also people that are, if not running away, but looking for a safer, better place to live than Europe and the United States, given the anti-Semitic incidents that are increasing in number. Abadi adds if they want to live in Israel, that's understandable, and that the Gulf can serve as a stop on their ultimate trip home. For others, he foresees the balmy Gulf states becoming the new Miami for Europeans and even Israelis, where people can escape winter weather. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. There's another big change in the Gulf. There's no question Saudi Arabia has the furthest to go when it comes to religious freedom. But it's also true, few countries can boast the type of change happening in the kingdom. Jennifer Wishon explains. Christmas trees? Even talk of a future Christian church? No, this isn't a fantasy. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is making and considering changes once thought impossible. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is incrementally moving in the right direction. Johnny Moore, who sits on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, never thought religious liberty in Saudi Arabia was possible. Now he thinks it's inevitable. It's still illegal for Christians to worship publicly, but in recent years, the kingdom's religious police have eased off raiding worship services. I would love uh, one day, you know, to, to uh, celebrate uh, Christmas on the Arabian uh, Peninsula. 
uh, you know, and, and this year, by the way, they allowed uh, Christmas trees, you know, in, 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 in the kingdom. And increasingly, you know, the rumors that, that Saudi Arabia might actually consider having a Christian church, you know, in, 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 uh, in, in the kingdom in some, some capacity. At this point, these are all rumors. But the very fact that they are rumors is is significant. Especially in light of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's aim to reform the kingdom's judicial system, Sharia law based on a strict interpretation of the Quran, one that's not tolerant of other faiths. Is this a pretty big deal? For the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia to say, no, we're gonna have we're gonna have laws like the rest of the world. And we're going to put those laws down on paper. I mean, this is an astonishing reform. Watchdog groups also point to improvements in the kingdom's school textbooks, removing some hateful references to Jews, Christians, and others. Increasingly, we're seeing strong uh, leadership throughout the Arab world that is pushing back on extremism and saying it's not enough to stop the extremist. The real way of stopping extremism is raising a generation that doesn't have to fear those who worship differently. Incremental moves that may one day lead to Muslims, Christians, and Jews coexisting on the Arabian Peninsula. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News. Up next, CBN's new film, Written in Stone, the evidence for King David. CBN Films presents... It's a very corrupt period in Jewish history at this time. Written in stone, Jesus of Nazareth. The emotion is one thing, but the scientific truth is something else. The life of Jesus changed the entire world. Jesus walked on this particular street. But what does archaeology say about where he lived his life? It's an authentic location in the life of Jesus. Join Gordon Robertson and unearth remarkable discoveries. Is it really the place where Jesus spent his last night on earth? Explore where Jesus traveled. Jesus went from one Jewish place to another Jewish place. Where he performed miracles. And he raised the little girl from the dead. And where he was tried by Pontius Pilate. Tradition is wrong. Get written in stone, Jesus of Nazareth. For a gift of any dollar amount, call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash written in stone. That changes everything. Watch breaking news, in-depth exclusive stories and programs from health to entertainment. You won't find anywhere else. The CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. Enjoy credible news reporting from around the world. Discover inspiring programs and stories of hope, all in one place from a Christian perspective. The CBN News Channel, a perspective you can trust. To watch the CBN News Channel, download the app or visit CBNNewsChannel.com. This Easter, spend time reflecting on Jesus' final week. In CBN's free devotional, The Hope for Redemption, you'll follow his path to Jerusalem, observe his last Passover meal, gain insight to his agony at Gethsemane, witness his crucifixion, and encounter the empty tomb. This Easter, realize afresh that he is risen. Get your free copy today. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash Easter Devotion. For those who believe the Bible, King David was the ruler of ancient Israel. But for a long time, skeptics said there was no proof he existed. Now CBN's new documentary, Written in Stone, House of David, examines how archaeologists are finding more and more evidence of that biblical kingdom. The Bible records David's story in great detail from his childhood as a shepherd in Bethlehem to his death in the royal palace of Jerusalem. But for centuries, the Bible was the only evidence that David existed. For a group of so-called minimalist historians, the biblical record wasn't enough. One Bible professor even compared David to the mythical King Arthur. They said, well, the biblical uh, tradition has been written only in the Hellenistic period. Everything is legend, and no David, no Solomon, and no kingdom of Judah, no temple in Jerusalem, and so on and so forth. They said the Bible is mythology, nothing is true. But then came the Tel Dan Stila. 20 miles east of the Dead Sea, in what is now Jordan, a stone tablet, or stila, was discovered in 1868. 
The inscription on the stone dates to around 840 BC, less than 200 years after David's rule. It was written by a Moabite king named Mesha, an enemy of Israel. And it contains the first known reference to the house of David outside the Bible. On the stone, Mesha talks about being taxed by and later rebelling against the house of David. A story also recorded in 2 Kings chapter 3. The same phrase, house of David, turned up on another stone more than a century later, this time in northern Israel, in the ruins of a city known as Tel Dan. The shadow of Mount Hermon, the Dan River comes out, and there's an ancient city there with mud brick arches close to 4,000 years old from the time of Abraham and with remains from the time of the kings of Judah, including a high place where idols were served. That's an event mentioned in the Bible. In 1993, Israeli archeologists found an inscription near the remains of the city gates. Written in the 9th century BC, the Tel Dan Stila is believed to be the earliest non-biblical mention of David. The king who writes that down is Hazael, and he actually brags. He's bragging to his friends all around, I have succeeded Yehoram, the Jewish king from the house of David. In order for him to succeed over the Jewish king from the house of David, there needs to be a fight with the house of David. And we know Yehoram because Yehoram actually exists in the house of David from the 9th century BCE. This still is amazing because it's something like 80 years after King David has passed away. So there is already a dynasty and you find it in Israel. The significance is that he has been recognized by another king who actually talks about fighting with him. It was such a dramatic event that it's recorded in the stila and also in the Bible. The still coming from Tel Dan was a big wow. And it actually proved for the first time the existence of the dynasty of King David, which was back then a challenge. So you cannot claim anymore that King David is a mythological figure. In this moment, the mythological paradigm collapsed. A few years later came the low chronology paradigm. This guy said, okay, there was David, but he was only a Bedouin sheikh living in a tent. And in his period, there were no fortified cities, no administration, no writing, no central authority. And then came Herbert Kayafa excavation. If you'd like to see the entire film, you can log on to CBN.com. It's a great gift for your family, church, or home group. Up next, despite COVID-19 restrictions, the Jewish people continue the celebration of Purim. Thank you for watching Jerusalem Dayline. We're committed to providing you with unbiased reporting from the Holy Land. Through weekly broadcasts, podcasts, and online media, our vision is to reach millions around the globe with the true story of what's happening in Israel and the Middle East, all from a biblical and prophetic perspective. This is a big vision and is only made possible by the generous support of people like you. Call us toll free at 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash Jerusalem Dateline and make a donation that will help spread the light of truth about Israel throughout the world. Roman soldiers destroy the Second Temple of Jerusalem. Centuries of eyewitnesses say the temple treasures survived. But where are they? They went from Jerusalem to Rome, Rome to Carthage, Carthage to Byzantium. Historians are silent about what happened to it next. CBN Documentaries presents the worldwide release of Treasures of the Second Temple. So does it still exist today? A story of mystery. Where is it? Calamity. Most of the victims were butchered. And destiny. The possibility to dig is impossible. Get your copy of Treasures of the Second Temple. Yours for a gift of any amount to CBN Documentaries. It has the power to influence weight loss, boost your immune system, and improve brain function. We've seen an explosion of data on the role of the gut microbiome in health. 
The free Build a Better Gut booklet reveals the latest information about the gut microbiome. You'll discover how your gut affects the rest of your health. The gut microbiome has been linked to depression and cancer and heart disease. Learn how to build a stronger, healthier gut. The microbiome, if it's in good composition, are really protecting us all the time from more invasive things. Get the Build a Better Gut booklet, free from the Christian Broadcasting Network. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash build a better gut. You need to make sure that your microbes are working with you, not against you. And if you order online, you'll get immediate access to the Build a Better Gut series, a digital copy of the booklet, and related bonus material. Build a better gut today. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash build a better gut for your free copy. Purim is usually a festive holiday celebrating the Jewish people's victory over a wicked power broker who wanted to annihilate them as told in the book of Esther. But now, just three weeks after the third lockdown ended, the Israeli government slapped a nighttime curfew on its citizens for the Purim holiday weekend in an attempt to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Before the curfew, you could see people in masks and costumes, but Purim has been celebrated by the Jewish people for thousands of years. We thought it would be good to take a look at how Purim is usually celebrated in the non-COVID year. The celebration of Purim is a reminder that the God of Israel watches over His people. Empires have come and gone, but the Jewish people remain. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can also access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blast so you can continue to receive all of our exciting CBN content. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.